Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Anchor Science Club. My name is Max Hall. I am the Secretary of Anchor Science Club and your host for this evening. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming out on this cold, cold Alaskan day. See, we have a packed house, so enough bodies here should keep everybody nice and warm. I'd like to thank the Taproot for hosting us here. Um, there you go. Taproot is a fine purveyor of warm food and cold beer, so order plenty of it. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to thank Alaska Commons for coming out and filming our uh, presentations. You can find them on their website, alaskacommons.com. And you can also view uh, past science pubs that we had for uh, the year. And if you all have been following on our Facebook page, tonight's presentation is on thermodynamics. Now, from what I understand reading about it, thermodynamics is a game. Um, you have to win to play it. You can't win it. <laughs> you can only break even. You can't break even. And you can't stop playing the game of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics sounds a lot like marriage to me. And getting into it, our presenter is here today to explain the simple beauty of the laws of thermodynamics. She's a mechanical engineer, a writer, a musician, an obsessive thermodynam thermodynamics geek. Her musical Gracie and the Atom won a Portland Drammy for original score. Her book Physics for Rock Stars was published in 2014 by Penguin uh, Random House. And I believe she had a few that she brought here today to be sold. Uh, she hosted Brad Meltzer's Brad Meltzer's Decoded on the History Channel and Under New York on the Discovery Channel. Please give a warm welcome for our uh, our our speaker here today, Miss uh, Christine McKinney. figure out how to use a computer first. I'm smart. That's what I wish I looked like playing guitar. That's, I am going to play a song, but I won't look like that. So how do I uh, get it going? Is it the little arrow forward? Great. So I wrote a book uh, called Physics for Rock Stars because I was very worried that um, there are a lot of creative, brilliant people who are missing out on the, the fun of the laws of physics. And not just um, not just missing out on them, but really uh, missing out on the comfort that they provided me. Um, and so I wrote this book and tried to just, uh, from the high school level physics, just took uh, one chapter for each concept. Like, I don't even remember what the chapters were now, but just as, as I learned them in high school, in Catholic school, and tried to explain them in the most um, simple way possible, and then explain uh, how they would use them, how the reader might use them if they were a rock star or a runway model or secret agent. Because I think that we make science too boring, and I'm trying to sort of fix that. And the reason um, I turned from science hater to um, science um, evangelist, really, is that um, I feel like people are missing out, and that makes me sad. But also, uh, I think that if we don't do that, then we're operating on just a very small percentage of our, our human brain power, and we can't afford to do that anymore. So that's why I get up here and do these kinds of things. Um, and I realized that as I'm talking about uh, temperature and entropy and Maxwell's demon today, that most of you in the room already get it. You already know these things I'm talking about, except you, sir. I'll make it. I'll just try and simple it down. <laughs> <laughs> He's over there shaking his head. No, I don't. I know I'm not the right Please don't hurt me. But I'm hoping that even if you are, you know, amongst the, the physics lovers and scientifically literate, that you'll hear something sort of funny or sticky or some, some way that you can help um, be a better scientific missionary. Because that's kind of what we're stuck doing if you're amongst uh, the scientifically literate. We do need to make sure we bring everybody else along. 
And if we do that, then it, it, we might find that the next great idea for you know preparing and storing storing food for refugees comes from a line cook at Denny's or you know like someone who maybe didn't even entertain college but has really great ideas. I want all of those people to understand how things are made and just the basic laws of how how heat works, how um, air behaves, how water behaves, because then we can all use all our great ideas. Okay, so that's why I'm doing this. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a, of a glimpse into how I turned from a science hater to a science freak. Um, <clears throat> So I went to uh, I went to Wendler Junior High. Here I, we uh, my family moved in the middle of eighth grade, and in Wendler Junior High I just hated. Did anyone else go to Wendler by the way? Go Rams! Go Rams! That's a shocker. Um, and I hated hated science, and it was at that age in eighth grade it's biology, and so it was just very messy and random, like literally and figuratively random and incredibly boring. And at that point, um, all I really got out of it was the scientific method that you create a hypothesis and then you test it and then you make a new hypothesis. And I thought that was a pretty cool way of thinking, but everything else in it I hated. And so the only, my first real science experiment was to try to not be a smart kid or geek, but to be a cool kid. Because my hypothesis was they looked like they were having more fun. The cool kids, they had better options of mates. I had zero options for mates. I was in band, ran cross country. Yeah. So I dropped it out of the I dropped out of the gifted program and decided to just be cool. And that didn't work. It wasn't helpful. I wasn't happier. Um, and the cool kids still didn't like me. So sad. So that was the only that was the only real way that I used the scientific method at all until much later in life. And then in halfway through eighth grade, my family moved to California and. Um, they saw the cool trend coming and enrolled me in a girls Catholic school. <laughs> Just <laughs> nipped it right in the bud. <laughs> and I was, I was really looking, I mean, as a lot of, I think, you know, thoughtful 14 year olds, that is not an oxymoron, a lot of thoughtful pre-adolescents are looking for something sure, like something that, that we can actually believe in. And so being enrolled in a Catholic school, I was like, great, this is, we weren't at all Catholic. Um, still aren't uh, my family. So I, I, I really embraced it. We studied New Testament first, and I was really like, this is it. This is the Word of God. This is, I'm 100% in. I think I was a little too much in, because like, you know how someone that's new to, new to it becomes like a little bit crazy about it? So I got really into the New Testament um, so much that, that the, the nun teaching the class kind of pulled me aside and was like, you know, every culture has their myths, and a lot of these just came from Egyptian stories. I was like, oh, shit. I spent six months just praying my ass off. And yeah, all for naught. So thankfully, the next class I took was uh, with Sister Michelle, uh, this really sturdy, uh, she looked like a, a small, powerful gymnast, and she taught some basic science. And there was, she was very sure of what she was saying. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. She would like suck all the air in a little plastic jug and just watch it crumple. And she, and she never did a take back. She never said, well, these are myths handed down from the Egyptians. Like, so I, she was completely sure of science. And so I, I got on board um, because I was still sort of smarting from my disappointment with the New Testament. I hope I didn't offend any Christians here because it's, it's not that it's not. I mean, it was Sister Eleanor who. who <laughs> Is that a take back? They're a very liberal group of nuns. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's how I kind of started. Even though uh, literature, English, writing, and history were the natural subjects for me, and math and science weren't, I had a sense that math and science had some real comfort and some real answers. Um, and also studying, you know, multiple revolutions in Shakespeare did nothing to make me think that life was going to be better if I was a writer <laughs> or a historian. Okay, so let's get on with it now. Now that you understand my zeal, it's a little scary. I'm going to talk about the re the the true definition, true nature of temperature, 
entropy and then Maxwell's demon because we need to have some basic understanding of both of those to get into Maxwell's demon and then what Maxwell's demon just the idea of it and what our thoughts about it mean to us today are you ready for that yeah. is anyone scared oh, yeah. I mean I, we know you're scared but is anyone else scared are you good you're willing okay that's all that's all we need right now um, okay so the, the next real science I took was um, chemistry and if you are looking for order and meaning in the universe, holy, you, you can't do better than that. Like this was, this was kind of a revelation for me that first I thought, oh, well, this is just like a little game. Like they've just sort of um, laid out the atoms in sort of a tile thing as like a, so you can memorize them or something. Oh, no, this is actually how they lay out. This, isn't that incredible? Yeah, okay. So it also taught me a bit about dating, like that helium had one electron to give and fluoride had seven. And so, is that right? The, like the covalent bond, they share electrons in their outer orbital. And they share them, they share them pretty, um, I'd say in a civilized way, in a way that onlookers would not be horrified. But in ionic bonds, is that what they're called? I'm not a chemist, but where the, one of them rips the electron from the other, just leaves them shivering and naked, and then they're just magnetically drawn to each other and they can't get away from each other, even though it's not healthy. <laughs> You can learn a lot about dating here. And, I, and I, I make a pitch in the book that everybody should understand which column in which column they reside. I'm a noble gas over there. <laughs> and, and knowing it helps. Like, I just don't bond easily. Like and they're, they're a little stuck up, honestly. They kind of avert their eyes from what's going on in the rest of the periodic table. So after uh, chemistry, uh, the next next thing we took, I think they do it differently now, but the next thing we took was physics. And that's where, um, I had a crush on chemistry, but physics I just absolutely fell in love with. Um, and, and one of the main things you do in physics class is talk about conversion of energy, right? From kinetic to potential, what other kinds, elastic, chemical, thermal is kind of a form of kinetic. And so, just to just so you remember this, um, just refresh everyone's memory. If you're on a trampoline and you jump on the trampoline, what is when you're at the top of your jump? What do you have most of? What kind of energy? Potential. Potential. Yeah. And then if you're just about to hit the trampoline, what do you have most of? Kinetic. Kinetic. And then when you're at the bottom of the the trampoline and it's stretched, what do you have most of? It, yeah, it's it's elastic potential. But yes. Um, and, it, and what is the, if you just sort of not move, you would eventually sort of stop because of friction. So what's the energy that you're, that you're putting into the system? Chemical, that's right. So chemical, so your, your muscles are, are processing energy and turning it into kinetic. So if you think of a trampoline, it's a really easy way to, to remember how energy goes back and forth. And that was, I just, and, and engineering, by the way, the reason I've created this slide of a, of a longshoreman lifting a bale of kale. I, I did have a side of bacon, but it was just too offensive to people in Portland, right? So it's a bale of kale. So engineering is really the sort of art and science and practice of making all that energy conversion um, more efficient and making it so, so that it's not a person down here and it's not a horse. It's an engine. You're, you're converting coal or nuclear power or some kind of heat into motion. So that, that is really, in a sense, what engineering is. You're moving energy around and putting it where you need it most in the most efficient way. So in physics, I was about three quarters of the way through physics. I was just 100% on board, felt just like the world was opening up to me. And then our teacher explained the second law of thermodynamics. So the first law is energy is neither created nor destroyed. Yeah, it just it just um, changes forms, like in the trampoline. The second law is, you can say it a million different ways, but um, whenever any one of these transitions takes place, it's done so in a messy way that can't be reversed. You can't just hit it in reverse and take it all back without some energy loss. I know it's sobering, it's almost sad. we not very quiet. <laughs> So, so um, to an engineer, what this means, what entropy means, it sort of suggests that concentrated energy has less entropy than diffused 
energy, right? So a system, this, uh, um, a, a tank with steam in it can do work. See that piston? It, it can move that piston, and work is force times distance, right? If I let out some of that steam and let the steam into the room, it will bounce other molecules around and it'll do some work, but it won't be useful to me anymore. Right? Right. Everything settles. Heat creeps and everything settles. Okay, so let's get, so before we get too far into that, let's get into the, the real meaning of temperature. So temperature is, is really when we talk about how warm something is or how cool something is, we're talking about how quickly the molecules are moving around. I'm just going to use molecules rather than atoms and molecules. So, gosh, I can't, I don't have a pointer. But if you see the, see the red line, if that's a line for one temperature, the, the molecules are actually speeding around all at different speeds. So if you go back to that piston, those molecules are, it's not really a racetrack as much as it is bumper cars. And we don't really feel, that. we just feel what the, we feel what the room feels like because our molecules are responding to that. But if you were to look at the speed of each molecule, this is important later for Maxwell's demon, there's actually a distribution of speeds. And as you, as the temperature gets colder, the distribution gets tighter and the molecules move more slowly. But it's interesting to see that in the hot, you've got some that aren't moving very quickly, and in the cold, you have some that are moving quickly, and there's actually a bit of overlap. So one sort of admittedly strange way to talk about temperature is to think about an Easter egg hunt. If you were to, if you were, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about just your backyard Easter egg hunt with a few cousins, I'm talking about like, blood will be shed, like a church, a church sort of Super Bowl of Easter egg hunts, where the gun goes off, because no one has any idea the reason for the season, and, um, and the kids go insane. Now, if someone were to ask you, how fast are the kids moving? It's a really hard question to answer. You could say, well, there's one on the ground there. He's not moving at all because he's been knocked out. And then there's one moving at seven feet per second because she's way too old for this hunt and he's trying to sell the prizes for drug money or something. So you could give an average. You could focus in on a few. But it's tricky because they're falling down and bumping into each other and they're transferring energy between each other. So when you think about temperature, it's a... It's a summation of a very complex situation and a, and a constantly changing situation. So as the competition cools down, they would get slower and slower and slower, and your estimate of their average would also reduce, right? There's no reason for this slide at all. I just feel like I have to bring slides in this one. It's so funny. It's just... It's such a, it's such a reasonable reaction for a kid. <laughs> There's a big, hairy thing with huge, vacant eyes trying to touch me. <laughs> All right, so that's the, that's the nature of temperature. You just have to remember as we get into this that temperature isn't one thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, a summary of a very chaotic situation. Gosh, I'm just way off my notes. <laughs> Who knows what will come up? Next. Oh, we're back to the tank. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so that's the nature of temperature. The nature of entropy, the way an engineer describes it is the higher the entropy in a system, the less available thermal energy is to do work. So it's a very human-centered, very engineer-centered kind of definition. As long as those molecules that are zipping around are inside of that tank, I can get some work done with them. If I let them out in the room, suddenly I'd have to run around and try and grab each of the fast-moving molecules and try and jam it back in the tank, and that will take more energy than I'll ever get out of the system back. Make sense? So any anytime there's energy conversion, the entropy of not just the, the tank, but everything around it increases. I know, are you hanging in there? Because you're my canary in the coal mine. Okay. <laughs> if he drops, we'll all just start drinking beer and we'll just forget about this whole thing. <laughs> oh, and two, um, so you can say, as I did in high school, well, look at that tank. 
whatever you did to heat that up and get those molecules moving quickly, that was, a, that was an exercise in the reduction of entropy. Well, not really, because you had to do, you had to either fire up an electric heater or burn some coal or light a lighter. You had to do something that had its own inefficiencies built in. This is a very, very um, simple cartoon of a power plant. So off on the upper right is the, is the generator turning. But in the lower left, you've got to add something to create that heat for the steam turbine. So in order to make that tank heat up, this is what's happening way, way, way down the line. So whenever you think, aha, the entropy is actually, is actually being reduced in this situation, all you have to do is pull the camera back and you'll find that that isn't true. And you're gonna walk around and just, aha, trying to break the law of cycle off thermodynamics. A refrigerator, okay, this is the one that if you think about, oh, my refrigerator does a great job of keeping the hot out the back and the cold inside. So it's breaking the second law, right? Well, it's not really, because if you look at the refrigeration cycle, which I will not talk you through, <laughs> most of you know it anyway, right? If you look at the refrigeration cycle, something, see that W on the right side? That's work. We're putting work into the system. So in order to get that cold and that hot separated, we're doing something. We're burning electricity, we're burning gas, we're doing something over there. I really did want to talk you through the refrigeration cycle, but now I feel like it would be too much. <laughs> it would. It's easy. It's reversible. It can go either way. Okay, so now, we're, now we have some understanding of the randomness of temperature and what entropy is, right? Okay, yeah. you already did, good. <laughs> this is, um, this is, is it James Clerk Maxwell? Uh, he's a Scottish scientist with a hell of a beard. I just, I love a good beard, even when it sort of separates in the middle like that. He still gets full points for that. Um, there's a lot of Scottish guys on the, they'll, they'll, you'll see a few more beards, by the way. I'm a little bit obsessed. Um, so he, he created a thought experiment um, around this whole second law of thermodynamics. And he said, well, what if, let me see, I'll just make sure there's no Easter Bunny or something like this. So we know, we've already said that if you've got hot, fast-moving molecules, and you have cold, slow-moving molecules, if you let them just sit there, ignore the demon for the moment, if you let them just sit there, it's all gonna turn warm and blah. The, the fast-moving ones are gonna knock around the cool ones, the cool ones are gonna take the energy from the fast-moving ones, and it's all gonna just turn warm. That's how it works, because heat is creepy, and heat just creeps into the cold side. But Maxwell said, well, okay, what if we just um, placed a little, a little, well, we'll call it, a, we'll go ahead and call it a demon. He didn't name it that. But what if we placed a, a little gatekeeper right there? And every time there was a particularly slow moving molecule on the hot side, we opened the, the demon opened the gate. And every time there was a particularly fast moving one on the cold side, the demon opened the gate. Because remember, there are kind of slow ones even on the hot side, and there are kind of fast ones even on the cold side, because this is just a big old Easter egg hunt. So what if, the, what if the demon was, just, and this is the way he described it, was just this um, infinitely intelligent being that could just know the, the motions of every molecule and open the gate at just the right time. So, well, first of all, the first problem is there aren't eight molecules on each side. There are, I don't know how many, what's a mole? Six times 10 to the 23rd, and there are many moles. So it's a mind-boggling number of molecules. I think there's going to be another beard on the slide. So this was Maxwell's thought experiment. Oh, and this is this is my version of a Maxwell's demon. It was kind of a, a bouncer at a club. Like you're you're hot enough, you're moving fast enough, you get through here. Like you're cool enough, you, you get through. No, 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 not your friend. Just you. Just you. <laughs> that's that's what I imagine Maxwell's demon doing on a molecular level. But you can already see where this is going, right? You can already see the problem. So this is Lord Kelvin, who named Maxwell's demon the demon. He was the one that gave it the name. And I think he did it just to be shitty. I don't think he, I don't think he, wanted, I don't think he liked the idea of the second law being broken. And also, he was jealous, because his beard is not as cool. Very clear to me. 
God, I hope there's something sensible coming up. Do you know who this is? Jewel. And I can't say what the... Uh, yeah, I don't want to... Um, no, it's not the singer Jewel. No, it's not her dad. This, is, this guy was the son of a, a Scottish um, brewer. So beer and science have been mated for a long, long time. And what he wanted to do... Um, he was a very practical engineer kind of guy. And he wanted... I feel like I missed a lot of, about Maxwell's demon here, but we'll circle back. Um, he wanted to prove that there was an equivalence, equivalency in all kinds of energy. So you can take thermal energy, like they were doing in his time, and make a steam engine and turn a paddle and do something in his brewing process, right? But he also proposed that if you can do that in one way, you can switch the direction. And so he created an experiment that um, I think they still do in high schools today where he dropped a weight on one side, which moved a paddle, which raises the temperature of the liquid, which is a little, a little surprising. You wouldn't think that just stirring something would raise the temperature. But if there's potential energy into motion energy, that should raise the temperature. And he proved that that was true. And I only say this because it's important to remember that it works the other direction too. So a change in temperature can give us motion energy can give us potential energy. And you can think of a million, you know, chairlifts work like this. Oh God, I'm afraid, like, the slides are going to stop giving me any hints. Oh no. So, if we, if we had a Maxwell's demon that was really doing its job, and then this, and this highly intelligent being could sit there and open the gate at just the right time and keep the hot hot and the cold cold, we would be able to fuel, for, this is just one example, this is a Stirling engine cycle. And whenever they show you the Stirling engine cycle in school, they say, well, there's a hot well and there's a cold well. We don't really talk about where that heat and that cold were coming from. But if we had a constant, uh, you know, an unending heat and cold well because Maxwell's demon was sitting there making it happen, well, then all our energy problems are solved. So this Maxwell demon thing, Maxwell's demon thing is, a, is an essential question. It's worth, it's worth discussing. So can you, can you already think of the problems with Maxwell's demon, if we go back to it? So there's a creature, it is all-knowing and all-seeing, and it does something and it doesn't cost anything energetically when it takes this action. We have to feed the demon something. So we're still back to, it's still a question of getting something for nothing. Right? Yes. So, and the interesting thing now, when you look now, as I was sort of like looking through um, what we've proposed as being the Maxwell's demon over the centuries, over the decades, it's probably, um, it, that conversation aligns with our own technology. So when um, friends of Maxwell's were talking about this originally, they were like, well, maybe it's a little trap door with a spring on it that is just the right tension so that a fast moving molecule could get through. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because then the spring, is, it has its own, in, in, even you're following that. <laughs> right. It has its own in <laughs> Right. Yeah, you don't get anything for free. Right. So if he's saying there's this all-knowing being opening the door and keeping track of the staggering amount of information, and that will break the second law, well, that's no threat to the second law. Because you're basically saying there's a god sitting there at the gate that's also... It's also kind of a bouncer and a troll guarding a bridge. Well, it's just not going to happen. But the conversation is, is, is important to us. Because if we can find even a budget demon, even a demon that does this but takes some energy, then we can fire a Stirling engine. Then we don't have to, do, we don't have, to have refrigeration cycles anymore because we've already separated the hot from the cold. Then we don't have to worry about heating systems. I mean, once you're able to separate hot from cold, you kind of own the universe. So the, the question has changed over the decades. So it went from, well, what if there's just a spring trap door? Well, that didn't work. What if there's, what if it's in the age of chemistry, it was like, what if there's like a molecular screen and it understands how, how to let one molecule speed in from one side and the other in from the other side? Well, now that we're in the age of information, so here's the current conversation. What is it? What if Mike? What if Maxwell's demon is just kind of some microprocessor? 
because that's what is that's the kind of thing that is really good at taking massive amounts of information and acting on it. But if it's a microprocessor, here's where the conversation goes. It costs something to gather and store energy. And, and now, the car, to get us completely current on the conversation, we're now trying to quantify what does it cost energetically to store information, to gather and store information? And then what does it cost, if the, if the demon is learning all this information, does he, needs, does he need to quickly forget it? So then he would be taking information, acting on it, and immediately forgetting it so we don't have to store the information. This is when it starts to get painful to think about. So the demon truly, truly is in the details here. <laughs> right? But, but it's a worthwhile conversation, especially as we talk more and more about energy use, and we talk more and more about um, how we save the resources that we have. So Google, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, um, just Google Maxwell's Demon and find the most recent conversations. Because there are some really good articles you know, from the 90s. You'll also be, they'll try and sell you like a Tandy computer in the ads. <laughs> but if you get yourself current on the conversation, it is a fascinating ride through our understanding of technology. Okay, I am not sure what's happening here. Oh, it's just, yeah, it's just back to, to Maxwell because it's worth, it's worth really thinking through why this doesn't work. This guy is sorting, right? But when he opens the gate, he's, he's taking some action and he needs some fuel. That's me. <laughs> now that's just, that's just my cue that, that I can play a song at this point. And then, okay, so I'm going to play a song about... Um, intentionally courting chaos, and then we'll we'll have a Q and A. Because I feel like I just dumped a bunch of stuff on you that, like, the first ten minutes was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know, and then the last ten was like, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> so we can have a conversation. I'm gonna take some layers off. But even if we, um, like it's a really grown up exercise to look at not just how we spend energy, um, but what the collateral chaos is. And um, this is where I get weird. I do think that, that oh, this is where you get weird? <laughs> I do think that that is also a really good um, personal exercise to figure out what are my actions, you know, they're helping me, I, I'm, I'm better off because of this job or because of this action. Um, but what is the collateral chaos out in the world? And I think that even if we're the smartest, most compassionate adults, we still have a craving for chaos, and every now and then we just light some shit on fire, <laughs> figuratively and literally. That's what this song is about. And it's also about like being totally devoted to the not being able to take something back, doing something that you don't even want to take back, and that... Um, they just reveling in the irreversibility of it. I'm super fun on a first date. <laughs> because not only it's the worst, because not only do I start talking about this stuff, then I'm super judgy if you can't keep up. <laughs> well, it's really not that hard. <laughs> It's a song about chaos. I use the word entropy. I don't know why I'm not a huge hit on the radio. <laughs> and I forgot uh, to ring a pick, and so one was provided.
Okay, we're going to have a little Q&A here with Christine, so uh, any questions? Yes, sir, you. Why is the bouncing around and increasing temperatures these burn marks on the skin? Oh, why does, why does your skin get burned? Yeah. Well, at that point you can't even think about it as bouncing around. It's, it's that your um, skin is, is flammable, meltable, whatever. So it, it, uh, it gets enough energy to start a chemical reaction. Just like if you were burning a log, like, like the log on its own doesn't burn, but once you start a reaction, um, the bonds wanna go to the least possible energetic state. And so that's a combustion reaction. I lost you somewhere, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if temperature is molecules moving around really fast, is uh -huh. it like a five trillion car pile up on the highway? It's more that um, once they're moving around fast enough, they provide enough energy for a chemical reaction. Oh, for changing? Yeah, so like if you, um, um, you burn the log in the fireplace, and then in the morning you regretted doing that and everything that happened in front of that fireplace, then you can give back all that heat and light and then you'll still just have a charred log because the, the breaking down of the chemical bonds is what really just happened. And it would be so complex to try and put them back together. That's that increase in entropy. So a, a difference in frequency and temperature can create different chemical reactions, which is useful for that. Yeah, it's the energy. It's that there's enough energy now that, that can be used for like boiling water. So do you think you can relate energy, frequency of energy in different temperatures to music in different tones? Um, maybe someone smarter than me could relate frequency. Did you hear his question? The changing frequencies in vibration of molecules to um, frequencies in music. I'm sure someone's written an amazing article on that. <laughs> Thank you. Lady, young lady over there, you had a question? Um, sorry, oh, wait. Um, I was just thinking of the waves. Oh, yeah, true. Uh, the frequency of... But I don't really understand. I don't know about the frequency of vibration of molecules because of heat. That I don't fully understand. I just think of them as bumper cars. Because I'm a mechanical engineer. <laughs> That's all we need to know. Yes? Hey, uh, can you define energy? What is energy? Um, is it physical? God. That's a great question. Is energy physical? It, it, there are so many different forms of energy. 
that in some ways it is like a chemical bond in that log we just talked about that you feel bad about burning. That in a way is a physical um, form, as is the sun. When, it, when it's chemical energy, it really is physical energy. But it, then it can be stored in so many different ways. Like you're pulling back a rubber band and you've got elastic energy now. That's in some ways physical. Yeah, it's not a very satisfying answer because energy is a, a funky idea. It's like an ex uh, yeah, it's, it's an exchange. So what? So what is it? What is energy? Yeah. What is love? <laughs> what is energy? Yeah. Do you have an answer for that? No. I feel like you do. Oh, does someone have a better answer? So what are the, I mean, we can look at the units of energy. Well, the ability to do, yeah, but that's a very self-serving definition of energy. Yeah, it's the ability to do work, but that doesn't really get to the nature of your question. That's like saying love is the ability to have babies. <laughs> Lust, sorry. <laughs> Right. Well, the mo I think the mo he's asking about power generation. What's the so what's the leading edge? I just uh, a few years ago was on a project that uses. Um, so it'll do one cycle, just like a steam turbine cycle, but then we're getting better at using like the waste energy, like the energy that's normally just sort of dissipated atmosphere. We're getting better at doing cogen plants or cogeneration where you take sort of some leftover energy or energy from a hot water system or something and you and you cycle it through a second cycle. So that's it's it's um it still feels kind of caveman. We're still just, you know, burning natural gas, doing a cycle and then taking that runoff steam as hot water and doing yet another cycle or turning that into a heat exchanger for the domestic hot water. We're getting better at mining our own debris, essentially. Natural gas? I saw that. Yeah. What the hell? Right. Well, all the. In that case, though, remember that condensate can happen at, at some pretty boring temperatures. So you might not be. When you look at cooling towers, it does look like either it looks like pollution or just a waste. But sometimes it's it's a necessary sort of exhale of heat so it can come around as liquid and be pumped again. So sometimes it's not as, as wasteful as it seems, especially considering what's in the air already. I like the, the, the what the hell. What the hell? <laughs> yes. Actually, in reference to what yeah. the hell, uh, that generation plant does have a fourth turbine that is steam power, and it is using the waste energy of all the three turbines. Nice. But not, it, not at 100%, so there's still a little bit of big go out, but there is a fourth steam turbine. And then a statement, I noticed at the beginning you showed the picture of the, uh, I guess, longshoremen raising the bale of kale, uh -huh. but using no mechanical advantage. Well, um, Just thought, only, like, yeah, the only mechanical uh, advantage he gets is direction. Yeah, so he's he, got well, pulls. What he's pulling on the rope is only going... That's right. Yeah, yeah if you were to do arrows, it would just be the same okay. same I in every direction. Like a block attack yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, because in a way, if, if you do more than that, then you're creating a bunch of little mechanical advantage, little levers, essentially. Did everyone catch that? That there was no mechanical advantage going mm -hmm. on with the kale. But it's easier than lifting from a tree. Yes. You looked like you were really excited about getting to explain the refrigeration cycle and you didn't get to it, so can you explain the refrigeration no. cycle? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> What's, what's, worth noting, what's worth noting about the refrigeration cycle is that it's taking the latent heat of vaporization. So it's taking the, the, which is that bonding energy, the difference between water and steam. In order to get from water to steam, it needs to grab, the, the fluid needs to grab a bunch of energy. And in grabbing energy, it basically creates a, a, a cooling side. And then you can reverse that and it's a, it's a heat pump reversed either way.
but what I love about refrigeration cycles is you're playing with the ideal gas laws. So once you play with pressure, the material inside wants to either condense or vaporize, and when it does that, it has energy to give or it takes energy. Isn't that kind of cool? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like I already knew it. I just wanted to see. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, you were talking about okay. Uh huh. So if you uh, you were saying um, you're commenting on me talking about the demon lifting the gate. Yes, and you said energy is lost at that point, but no energy oh. is ever lost. It's just converted. converted. So what I meant is, if it's a door or a spring, there's going to be some friction or some heating of the spring, just like you would expect in. So the energy becomes the heating of the spring. Yes, totally. So it's lost in the heat. That's right. It's dissipated, not lost. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And my question is going to be even if there was not any friction, why did that work? Oh, the Sterling engine? Yeah, the Sterling engine cycle. Um, it's based on, again, based on pressure. So when you heat, when you heat this, the gas up, the working gas up, it wants to move the piston out of the way and it's attached to a crank such that the pistons have to react to each other so it's really just the other side and it's right if you had a demon involved in the sterling engine it's just over there keeping the hot hot and the cold cold and those continually run that cycle not if you had a demon that could do all the work for you all the deciding for you I know, it, 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 it's almost in fairy tale land when you start talking about Maxwell's demon. Don't you think all the old teenagers are taking the eggs and they're going to buy drugs? Uh-huh. Or should put them over on the other side? Oh, you'll run out of actual atoms after a while? Maybe, but, but you'll have a hot and a cold well. So we're assuming you can bring atoms in. Yeah, I, yeah. The Sterling engine was a little, was a, was a little tough one. Yeah. Does the Sterling engine exist? Right? Yes, the Sterling engine does exist. Yeah, yeah. And the, oh, I don't want to give away the questions, the answers to the. Yeah. And there are certain cycles that are considered, you know, ideal cycles, but you can't actually do in the world. And then there are cycles like at, uh, the power plant that you guys use that are usable, but there are all kinds of losses involved. So you can get, maybe an ideal cycle, you can run at 90%, but no one can get there, so a, a real power plant's gonna run at, I don't know, 50, 60% efficiency. Did you did you hear the question? <laughs> Electromagnetism. Discuss. <laughs> right. Feel free to use any media. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so it's another example of something elbows something else and it just gets converted. So if you run a wire between magnets, electrons want to move. I don't know why. I just don't know why. And the other way around, if you leave the wire and move, the, I mean, that's how generators work, right? I know. Not really, not really. I mean, I guess you could say that electromagnetism or the, the uh, potential in magnets is just another form of potential energy. And then we're back to his question, well, what is energy? It's our, it's our way of explaining how the universe nudges each other around. I don't know. There's a song. There's a song, totally. It's a whole musical, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, young lady over there, you have one more question? On what? I don't have any thoughts on this. <laughs> I often have my head down doing HVAC design um, for cities and Portland, and Portland Water Bureau, and so I don't always get to sort of, unless I'm reading like an ASHRAE journal. I'm gonna Google it now, though. 
Um, so, at some point in a, a system of collisions, mm -hmm. there becomes a point where, if you're observing the system, you can see the order in which it happens mm -hmm. and recognize it. So, for example, if you have like two pool balls that run into each other and then bounce back, if you watch it in forward or reverse, you can't tell which way it happens. If you right. watch the video forward or reverse. Right. But if you watch one pool ball colliding with a bunch and they all spread out, it looks very weird if you watch uh, it going forward versus if you watch it going in reverse. Yeah. So I guess my question is, at what point does that switch happen where you start to recognize that time is defined in a certain direction based on the way it is? At what point do you start to recognize it when it's when it's heat and it's molecules? Or so in, in just like a two-body collision, mm -hmm. you can't tell what happens forward or reverse right. uh, based on Newton's laws. But in a many-body system, that becomes obvious if it's happening forward or reverse. Right. And so my, my question is just at what point do you move from a, a two-body system to a many-body system is, is it, how you define the is it that is it that once you have more than one reaction, then it's not then it's not then it wouldn't be reversible even by video. Well, even even if the balls don't interact in any other way, so like the splitting, they all shoot off in different directions. Mm -hmm. Seeing that versus seeing them all come back together and one ball shoot out, you know that's wrong. The system doesn't behave right. that way. Right. Um, so it's reversible entropy, I guess. Um, but if you look at just two balls hitting and bouncing back. But even that, when you look at two balls hitting and bouncing back, yeah. from a video perspective, it looks reversible. It's actually not. Sure. Because you still lost something in noise. You sure. lost something in, in deformation of the balls. Um, say it's an ideal situation. Right. So well, you're looking at times arrow, right? Yes, and exactly. The transition from yes. Yes. And even eyes time. <laughs> yeah. One of the thoughts I was having when you were talking is, oh my god, this guy's so smart with me. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I think it's a worthwhile question, though, and what she's saying is absolutely true when you start to go from thinking from molecule, molecules to pool balls, you're in trouble. Thank you. I think, I think she was yes? she kind of had a point. No, I was saying that like with, the, with his question, um, the video doesn't capture the heat energy or the sound energy lost, and so if you could truly see the reaction in reverse, you would see sound energy disappear and the balls cool down, and that also would not make sense. Right. So, in order for those that that two the two the balls hitting each other, you have to give back the sound energy. You have to right. give back the collision energy. It's like and it's like that burned log again. You can't do it. It's just right. too diffused at that point. So and at least at least the way I understand it, I don't think that there is a certain point in which it becomes a like you know a many body system or whatever. I think truly if you do look at it in reverse, then it does not. That's right. It's already not reversible even just the, the two collisions. Yeah. Did you have a question over here? Uh, I was uh, I was thinking of Yes. Yes, hi. Um, my question and then suggestion is going to indicate what kind of grades I got in physics. <laughs> but uh, the chart that you showed us, chemical chart, I was wondering because you, you mentioned uh, attraction and you mentioned love and you know other things too. Uh, the and, periodic table, yeah. And, and have you, yeah, have you considered recommending that chart? For use by dating services? <laughs> the periodic, periodic table dating service. Well, I wrote a whole chapter on it. Yeah. You know, I've, got, I've had the book for several days, and unfortunately, I'm not had time to read it. But. You know, and that's, by the way, that chapter about um, covalent and ionic bonds, because then I get into um, water. H2O, three stones and chains, and then I just refer to like how indecent it becomes, how quickly. Um, that chapter, a, a, a community college wanted to use the book, but they found that chapter problematic, so I had to give them a PDF copy and pull the chapter, because it was so indecent. What you have created here, and I think anyone looking around will think, as I did, darn, I missed that. Because I knew I should have gotten there sooner. Uh, you, yeah. You've shown what people want. And I think oh, a, good. I think a great slogan that I first thought of it 
months ago when I heard it the first time, since it would have changed, that we should have is that we want to make America smart again. Yes, <laughs> make America smart again. Yeah. There is a, a sort of patriotism in being as smart as you can be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Christine for her presentation here today. She's going to be here a little while longer, so if you'd like to have a one on one with her, she'll be right over here. Uh, she does have a few copies of her book still available for purchase, so they're on the table over there. So if you're on your way out, take a look at them. Uh, We'd like to present Christine here, oh, before she steps down, <laughs> with one of our uh, new Pilsner glasses that we've just gotten in. It's got the Anchor Science Club logo on the front, and of course, the molecule for ethyl alcohol on the back. <laughs> and then a gift from Pat for a, uh, just a little gift card so she can get a meal in her stomach before she has to leave today. <laughs> And of course, we have those uh, same Pizzler's glasses uh, available for sale. They are up at the front over there. They are $20 each. Think of it as a $10 investment to the glass and $10 donation for the Alaska Science Pub.